Hi, my name is Andres Freund. I'm a Postgres developer and committer. I've worked on Postgres for quite a while now. I, at the moment, work at Microsoft, uh, focusing on open source Postgres uh, and trying to make it better. And today I want to talk about why I think we could make Postgres better if we added asynchronous IO support uh, to PostgreSQL. Uh, and why would you want that? One angle to that is that uh, Currently, uh, the way we do I.O., and particularly the way we do buffered I.O., is a major limitation. And why do you think that? Like, one angle to look at is that it is a performance uh, limitation. And that's not the only one, but I think it's an important one. For example, uh, if you just look at the sequential scan of a large table, in this uh, case, it's an 80 uh, gigabyte table, um, we can see that we spend a lot of time uh, doing I.O., over uh, eight workers, we spend uh, 300 seconds, and we end up with a total query execution time uh, of like 46 seconds. And during that, we actually don't ever reach uh, the full throughput of the drive, which is like something on uh, the order of 3.2 gigabytes per second, even though we have uh, like a lot of workers to, available to do the work. And uh, why could that be? I think one good way to look at that is that uh, as a CPU profile, because it turns out that most of those processes are actually pretty busy on a, a CPU usage wise. And a profile shows us that we spend a lot of the time doing uh, in copy user enhanced. And what that function does is, is, is it copies, or in this case, it copies data from the kernel page cache into the buffer provided to like uh, to in the read system call. Um, provided to the read system call. And that's what we are doing with the CPU time. We're copying the data from the page cache, in the uh, even in the case where the data is actually not in the page cache. Even then, we spend a lot of time uh, doing that kind of work. And if you overall want to look at uh, like how many, much time do we spend in user space and how much time we spend uh, in kernel space, I've here used a uh, perf uh, to look at that one through with, with the number of cycles are they, as they are executed, and that's affected by things like turbo boost and like changes in frequency in ones uh, in a way that should uh, avoid that. And we can see that uh, around half the time there on, it will then do an IO to the drive, like an IO request, and the drive will use DMA direct memory access to copy uh, the data from the drive directly into RAM. It will not go through the CPU. It will instead like talk to the memory controller to like transfer the data without having to go each byte through the CPU. And that makes it much faster because the CPU can do other things uh, at the time. And once it's done, the drive will uh, raise an interrupt and uh, the operating system will then know that, hey, the, the work that the drive now signals is completed. Uh, is finished and now I can mark the page cache contents as valid and from there on it will then go on and copy the data the operating system uh, to into the buffers that the read system call has been provided and it has to be a bit a smarter mem copy with uh, extra safeguard guards that prevent us from like overwriting parts of the kernel memory or something like that that's why you don't see like a straight mem copy but like most of the time is spent just basically doing the work that mem copy also does and once that copy is complete, which in which time the CPU will be fully busy, the syscall uh, can return and the application now has valid data. But and during all that time, the application is uh, blocked. Comparing that to uh, the direct IO case, and direct IO here means uh, that we ask the operating system to bypass uh, various, like all buffering basically as much as possible and go straight to the drivers much as it can, uh, we can see that the system call, there's no page cache that it has to look data from, so it can di directly issue the IO to the drive, and then the drive, and that's the important part, can again do DMA, but this time it doesn't do DMA into the page cache, but directly into the user space buffers that were provided to the system call as parameters, which means that this time we don't need to ever do that uh, memory copy-like operation. To summarize, Direct O basically is IO where 
there's no buffering in the kernel and we're DMA often as possible between the user space buffers provided to read and write and so on and uh, the storage devices and that the user space has a lot more control but also a lot more responsibilities when uh, using direct out. There's no read ahead, there's no buffered writes and read and write are synchronous. And synchronous use is so slow for most purposes due to the latency that it's basically unusable uh, for something like Postgres. So because we cannot do it synchronously, we have to do it asynchronously, meaning AIO. Um, there's other parts of the system where like the uh, we have throughput problems and that some of that is in the background writer, which often can't keep up and not just because it has some algorithmic issues, which it has, but also just because of uh, the number of outstanding writes cannot easily be done given the way we do IO currently. Uh, Checkpointer often can't keep up as well, which is quite bad because like in a lot of workloads, all the writes have to like are going to be done by Checkpointer and delaying Checkpointers uh, can like lead to much more disk space being used for the wall and so on. So that's a problem. I think the biggest uh, remaining problem though is that uh, currently the wall writes are often uh, bottlenecked by having to do buffered IO and particularly by not being able to start initiate IO when we have finished a uh, certain amount of new wall uh, but we said we have to delay it until either uh, commit time or until we have written like a, so much that we can't buffer it anymore. And that means that we start the IO much later and thus it also obviously finishes much later and that leads to a lot of throughput issues. And I th think basically those are uh, hard to address fully without using AIO. What the hell? I don't know what just happened, uh, but uh, Whatever. There's also like other reasons for other sources. For, there's also other sources of uh, increased CPU overhead, not just the memory copy, but also like the page cache memory uh, management overhead in the kernel. You can see that, for example, uh, by often in like top, you see kswap D, for example, uh, use up a lot of CPU time. There's also just like the overhead of all those very small system calls that we do where to read like eight kilobyte blocks and that every time we have to, the kernel has to do some work in the file system specific code and then some page cache lookups for that. And that adds up. And there's also the generic cost for syscalls, which has also gone up due to the various security mitigations that were had to be introduced in the last few years. There are also reasons around uh, the lack of control that we currently have with buffered IO. We cannot really manage uh, how, when the kernel writes that back data back and that then leads to latency spikes because when it writes the data back suddenly wall writes and other activities are going to be slower which then leads to user visible uh, latency spikes and those can be very large. There's also problems around like kernel re level read ahead not being as effective as we would like it to. And some of that is related to uh, us having one gigabyte uh, segmented files for a table. So even if your table is la more larger than one gigabyte, it'll consist out of multiple files. And uh, every time it, you cross a segment boundary, the kernel doesn't know that it actually should immediately start a read ahead or that it actually should have started read ahead before we reached that point because it doesn't know that those files relate in any sort of way. Uh, it also doesn't actually read ahead fast enough, and particularly not on very fast or on higher latency storage like cloud block storage devices. Uh, our own manual read ahead that we do, for example, for uh, bitmap heap scans also has pretty significant costs. We do a lot of redundant work, once for the prefetching and once for uh, the actual read, and the OS also has to do a lot of that duplicated work. And to just as a motivating example for the next uh, 20 minutes, here is like a comparison of uh, how long it takes to read the data. And I chose to, in those numbers here, to just look at the time PG prewarm takes. And PG prewarm is basically just a function in an extension in Postgres that reads the data and you can tell it how it does that data does so. And like with a read parameter, it just reads the data using the, using the operating system facility and then throws it away. And if you use buffered IO, that 
then often like we'll end up with like the data in the kernel page cache, which can be useful. And in my new branch that adds support for asynchronous I.O., I added like AAO versions of both the read version uh, parameter type of pre-warming and also the buffer type of pre-warming, which actually reads the data into shared buffers. And you can see that if you just want to read the data, like, use read in master, we, it takes like 35 seconds and we use 80% of the CPU and we uh, like see 2.5 gigabytes a second of I.O. even though the drive can actually do rough, like nearly 3.2 gigabytes a second. And if you compare that to the AIO version, we can see that there, it takes a considerably shorter amount of time and uses less CPU, even though it takes a shorter amount of time and has a higher uh, bandwidth. It's not quite the capable, full capability of the drive. There's a few uh, optimizations we would need to reach fully reach that, but it's getting pretty close. And the difference is actually a bit starker if you look at uh, doing using the buffer that is like reading it into Postgres as a shared buffer, because now we need to have the CPU time to actually do the management of Postgres as shared buffers. There's some optimizations we could do there too, but that implies overhead and we need to have time, like CPU time to do that. And if we spend all the time doing uh, memory copies from the kernel in, in, during the read system call, then we don't necessarily have that. And that, so that's why we see uh, the total time increase and uh, CPU time increase, and importantly, the bandwidth to be much slower. And just there's just not enough CPU time to execute all those read calls. Comparing that to the asynchronous IO version, here we can see that um, we take a bit more time than when using read, but we can uh, still nearly saturate the drive. There is some uh, degradation performance, but it's still much better than either the read or the buffer version for master, and we, we aren't fully uh, bottlenecking. Uh, full, we, are not, we still have CPU cycles left. So I think that's a pretty good motivating example for wanting to change something. So if it's all that great to have support for asynchronous IO and buffered IO, uh, why don't we have that? And one big reason for that is that Linux's uh, asynchronous I.O. didn't used to support actually doing buffered I.O. asynchronously. And uh, there's a lot of workloads where using direct I.O. is not really an option just because you can't, you don't have the work knowledge about the specific workloads to, for example, set up shared buffers large enough. And it's pretty bad if you use direct I.O. and your buffer uh, caches or p shared buffers is not large enough because suddenly uh, you pay like each IO that you do will, if you do it synchronously, it will hit uh, like disk and it will do so one by one and each time it will full do full round trip. Uh, and I have here like a short uh, example of how bad that can be. And if you can think back of my earlier example where using direct IO plus IO to do the reads, uh, a PG pre-warm, we saw that it was taking like 27 seconds, I think. And if we do like the synchronous version using a uh, uh, direct arrow, because we the parameter here is read and not read AIO, we can see that it suddenly takes 160 seconds, much, much slower than any of the other variants. And that's because we don't actually have any prefetching and we, we, that we normally get from the operating system and we're not using AIO, so we don't get any prefetching from that and we can see that the throughput is drastically lower and that all the reads are very small so, so there's no combining of requests and so, so it's pretty bad so the consequences of not using direct arrow correctly can be pretty bad and the consequence for example that can be because we the implementation sucks or it can be that nobody has configured shared buffers so it's shared buffers 64 megabytes and the data is actually one terabyte large Obviously that's not going to work well, but it can kind of work okay if uh, we rely on buffered IO because then the kernel will like save our butt to some degree. And there's other reasons and one uh, so, like, it's a pretty large product to add it. And most people are not insane enough to try to fix, uh, like to add support for that because like I've spent uh, like a 
many weeks working on it and uh, it's a lot of work and it's unclear whether it's realistic to get into Postgres. It also adds a fair bit of post uh, complexity to Postgres. We currently, for example, don't have all the necessary read ahead logic to do that for sequential scans and all that. But if we want to have uh, uh, direct IO support, we need all that. So that's, I think, pretty okay reasons to not have it yet, but I think the time is well past where we should add support for it. Uh, so what has changed basically to make it viable to add, add it now? Uh, for me, the big reason is that Linux has gotten a new asynchronous IO interface and that interface is called IO underscore Euring and it's been added to the kernel in version 5.1 and it's a fairly generic interface. It like There's a lot of different IO operations uh, that are supported, might many more than uh, were previously supported uh, for the old AO interface. One can do like network IO, one can do open close files and uh, stuff like that uh, asynchronously uh, without not just like file IO. I just noticed a missing word here. Uh, the way it works is that it basically in shared memory, uh, that is in memory that's shared between kernel and uh, user space, there's two ring buffers, one for submitting IOs to the kernel and one uh, for getting uh, completion events for uh, those IOs that we submitted from the kernel back. And basically each of those are a single producer, single consumer uh, ring buffers. And the nice thing is that single producer, single consumer ring buffers can actually do be done without like atomic uh, operation overhead. And it also is very nice because we can submit a lot of different IOs without doing a system call. We can stage them into that queue and then do the system call to actually let the kernel know, please process them now. And then we can get all of those back, which then saves us from the overhead of doing all that many system calls, which have, as I mentioned before, were always uh, expensive, but added, gotten more expensive for the security mitigations. And it can also make operations asynchronous that aren't internally in the kernel actually fully asynchronous uh, by executing in the background in a kernel thread. And that means that the benefit of that is that the, that it would, the number of operations it can expose is much larger because edge cases and so on can just be uh, punted into that, in the, to those background kernel threads. Whereas the majority of operations can do like be done fully asynchronously without needing a dedicated uh, uh, thread in the kernel doing the work. The way it, as I mentioned, there's like basically these two ring buffers and like one ring buffer has the submissions and like the application basically just when it wants to do additional IO, it will can add uh, the uh, a submission queue entry and I'll get into what exactly that contains in a second. And uh, once it has done that, it can like update the metadata basically of the queue saying, hey, this is a valid entry. And uh, then from then on the kernel knows, hey, I can process data up to that. And when the kernel uh, process data, it will basically read like the other end of the queue and uh, it will read the entry, like transfer it into its own internal state. And then it can advance uh, the tail to mark that the, to tell the user space that, hey, you can reuse this entry in the ring buffer now. Once it has done that, it can asynchronously perform that IO. That can be buffered IO, that can be direct IO, that can be various other things. It can be like the network and so on. And once the, that has completed, and during this time, the application is free to do other things, submit more IO, whatever. Uh, once, but, and once the uh, IO Euring has detected, hey, the operation has completed, and that can be due to interrupts, that can be due to those kernel threads, uh, finishing their work, uh, it will put like a completion event into the, the equivalent queue that to the user space. And it's basically just the same press that we had earlier where it like, puts in a queue and into a queue entry and the user space basically just does what the uh, Ewing earlier did. It updates the tail after getting the data out. What do those uh, submission queue entries actually look like? 
it's basically a pretty simple C struct that we just write into memory, and there's an opcode, and then there's parameters for that opcode. And the opcodes, various of the opcodes are like stuff like reading data, writing data, f syncing, and doing network IO, waiting for readiness of network uh, sockets, and so on. The details aren't actually that interesting. So before we go on how I'm using this in my prototype to uh, to add AIO support, I think one it's important to figure out what are the important design constraints for like a real uh, real production level uh, support for AIO in Postgres. And I think the first one uh, is that we continue, as I mentioned, we need to continue to support buffered AIO. Uh, the second one is that we need to abstract away the platform uh, specific details. Uh, because we cannot have like leak all that across all of Postgres. We, because we start IO in lots of parts. We do it during DDL, we do it do it query execution, we do it do it doing backup, we do it doing checkpointing. If all of those uh, places know about uh, all the platform specific stuff we are going to be it will be a mess. So we all of that needs to be able to be hidden in a fairly small place. Uh, and one other thing and that even though it might seem like a implementation detail I think it's a pretty big co design constraint is that we need to be able to do a uh, cross process asynchronous IO and what I mean by that is that one uh, process needs to be able to start a, a, a number of a, a asynchronous requests and other processes need to be able to process the completions if the originating issuing backend isn't doing so and the reason for that is that it's otherwise extremely easy to get into deadlocks. And while those deadlocks could be avoided other ways, they would also reduce the be potential benefits very, very substantially. Imagine, for example, uh, a scenario where one backend has a lock on a database, that's backend A, and backend B does a number of IOs on blocks Y and Z. And after that, block, uh, backend A wants to access one of those blocks. And because the IO operations haven't finished it yet, it has to wait. And that's a case that we already have, and we'll just wait for the IO to complete. Uh, but it will only, in the existing implementation, we'll wait for the originating backend to do so. But because it's now asynchronously uh, done asynchronously, the originating backend is now able to do other work. For example, it could wait on a lock in this case that or that A already has. In which case, we would have a cl pretty classical deadlock. And there wouldn't be any progress anymore because nobody would see the completion event for the AO because the one the backend that issued the AO is busy waiting for a lock. So we need to have uh, be able like the backend A in this case needs to be able to see that hey this AO has completed and I can unmark the IO in progress and like really make the buffer be valid. And that means that's a pretty substantial design constraint, I think. And I was able to solve that, but and I'm, if somebody has great ideas how to not have this problem, I think it would be good, but I suspect that's not going to be possible. So how does the interface for asynchronous IO currently look like? Basically, uh, whenever you're wanting you, some part of the code wants to do IO, uh, it has to get an IO handle, and that's uh, number one here, and with that, on that IO handle it can optionally, when it wants to for its own benefits, uh, register a completion handler. And it's a completion handler that runs only in the issuing process. Even if another backend completes the IO, it will still run in the issuing uh, backend, okay, potentially a bit later. And once that that's very useful because inside that completion handler, it can then do stuff like, hey, the signal the sequential scan that it can continue. It can do things like, hey, I want to, I got some of my prefetching done, so I can issue new prefetching. And it can do, like, submit further writes in a uh, situation where, we, where we have limited the number of parallel writes to reduce the impact of the IO subs on the IO, IO, IO subsystem to, uh, and all that kind of thing. So, like, these completion callbacks, I, I found, make it much easier to efficiently issue IO. Uh, and after that, or if you don't do that, we actually associate IO with that IO handle. And in this case, we uh, 
do that, uh, do a read buffer, and the read buffer gets like a bunch of parameters that are very similar to what we currently do, except that it also has some information about which buffer that is. And it's important to note that when that the start read buffer associates an event with the AO that basically can complete uh, the read buffer operation in any other backend that if that uh, if it receives the completion or if it has to wait for that completion and that means like it will for a read will mark the buffer as now there's no IO in progress anymore and there's a bunch of complexity associated with that but that allows us to avoid the deadlocks and also actually reduces the number of context switches we need and so on so it like, ha has a number of uh, benefits and we can do like the uh, starting a IO uh, operation multiple times. And one thing to note here is that the start IO doesn't actually issue the IO directly. Instead, it will just stage it in a local queue, in a per backend queue, basically. And once, uh, because that avoids, if we otherwise we would incur the system call overhead every time, uh, which we don't want to. And we then we have to somehow cause the IO, the pending IO, to be submitted. And that happens if, you, if they're issuing backend for example, waits on the IO, or if it says, hey, uh, please flush all pending uh, IOs out. And once that, like the way that happens is that IO.c uh, now submits the IOs via IO Uring. And that's the first part place basically where IO Uring actually plays a role. And none of the calling code has to know anything about it because all of that is abstracted. Now, most code doesn't actually want to, it have like, to deal with uh, individual IOs on like that low level, they you've, we don't want to add like a lot of individual read management, like of how many reads are going on into sequ like you know, sequ in sequential scans into other forms of scans into like DDL code. Instead, like there's a number of generic helpers that say, hey, please, this is a sequential or read or a read where I know ahead of time a few more blocks that I need. And then there's a helper, PG streaming read, that knows how to do prefetching based on that. And it works by having a callback that tells it whenever it needs more data when to have enough deep enough read ahead window or uh, and a distance from the current uh, position in the scan, then it will issue, ask that callback that is provided by the caller, hey, which one would, is the next block that I actually would need to prefetch? And that makes it easier for the, I found that that makes the calling code a lot easier because it doesn't have to like be as careful about when to give it like more work to need, uh, to issue because that turned out to be very duplicative between different uh, call, uh, users. Um, and like that can be just the next block in a sequential order that what the callback returns. Or for example, in the case of vacuum, it might not be, it might just be the next block that we actually need to vacuum. So there can be large gaps and that allows us to still do very efficient IO across that. Uh, those gaps where we don't have to, where the visibility map tells us that we don't have to do IO. And that streaming read helper internally uses the local completion handler to get called back whenever an IO f finishes and it uses from there on then basically inside the callback says, okay, I my read ahead window is this large, but I ha haven't actually issued that many requests. So now I can uh, issue more. And similarly, there's a streaming write uh, helper that ha basically has a queue of outstanding writes and makes sure to issue them, uh, but all to, uh, not to have too many of them in parallel uh, outstanding to, so we don't overload uh, the system. And it's likely that we would have different parts of the system configured with different queue depths. So we can have, for example, um, a vacuum have a low queue depth for like the data file writes. So it doesn't, it's not overly impactful, but still can be like a, make a good amount of progress when there's not a lot of concurrent activity. Uh, and the way that works on a, as a part of the whole system is that there's basically a number of new shared memory structures that uh, are uh, independent of which I AIO implementation we are using. And that's uh, some per backend data structures that also includes like stats about how many IOs are in progress for that backends backend, which I think will be very useful for like 
some admission control like and for statistics gathering type work. And then there's a number of these uh, asynchronous IO handles, and that's the PGAO in progress array. And uh, those are independent of the AO implementation. And at the moment, that only the only AO implementation that's implemented is IO Uring. And the goal would be to have multiple uh, IO Urings uh, there. Currently, we create multiple ones, but we only use one. Uh, and that has some performance implications. Uh, but like I just haven't gotten around to implementing more. And those uh, IO in progress uh, structs basically get turned into something that IO Uring understands when submitting pending requests. And then uh, the those requests actually reference buffers and shared buffers in the in the case of uh, like a read uh, buffer operation and with that um, I, I operation there's the there's uh, a field where we can associate user data with that and that then refers again into the P, to the PGA or in progress entry that's associated and that allows us to then complete uh, the like issue the callback that will mark the buffer as valid and then also do the necessary work that the issuing backend can like call that callback that the completion callback and attached to like those io in progress entries are then used by the the, the various helpers or by code directly using it for example wall at the moment directly issues like ios because it has like a bit too specific uses that can't easily be generalized uh, and those helpers are then again used by like heap aim for scan heap scans and vacuum and for checkpoint and background writer and so on so what are the results of the um, prototype i think it's pretty decent for a prototype uh, that uh, is still like somewhat early in development uh, we can see very significantly increased throughput for both low latency drives and very large increased throughput for high latency and high throughput drives, as for example, the aforementioned cloud block devices. And that's because we have a lot better control over how deep the queues are. And this is the case both with buffered IO and uh, non-buffered IO. And some of the benefit there comes from being able to issue multiple requests for different blocks uh, at the same time. Some of it is allows uh, is from Doing, being able to do reads for multiple blocks at the same time, which then re reduces the overhead on the file system and page cache level. level. For uh, like the biggest benefit beneficiary, I think are is analytic style queries because they do often read a lot of data, and so they're very often very IO intensive, and often the data doesn't fit into memory. Still, even today, and uh, I did, for example, run uh, all the TPCH uh, queries on my workstation um, and on like using scale 100 and using different amounts of available memory. There were, uh, unless I ha used like ridiculously small, small amounts of memory, uh, every time uh, the both the buffered and the asynchronous uh, direct IO uh, variants were faster than the current implementation, which I think is a pretty good result. There's some edge cases where that's not the case in particularly, or where the benefits reduce, and that's when using a lot of wor workers for a parallel query execution, and that's because of the one Uring that we currently have. And then there's contention on locks protecting that Uring, and that's just because I haven't gotten around to fixing that. There's also some other cases if you don't vacuum uh, the data before running queries then like hot pruning and uh, hint bits and so on can cause problems because the ring buffers used in sequential scans and vacuum don't currently use uh, AIO yet. So there can be like more synchronous writes. Sometimes uh, background writer fixes that, especially if like one makes it more aggressive, but it's a problem that we have to fix. But it's again, I think not a fundamental issue. It's just something that needs to be done. For OLTP workloads, uh, the benefits are a bit smaller at the moment. They're off, like it's good, bit better. Like I saw PG Bench workloads with like 30% uh, better, uh, but I found also some cases where it's a bit slower. And I think both of those problems are 
or both the not yet much larger benefits in the good cases and the uh, slightly bad slower cases or mildly bad slower cases are of, uh, related to wall and to uh, it not yet using asynchronous IO very well. And that's, I think, partially because it's not that easy to do, but uh, partially also because I haven't yet spent too much time on it. And I think we can actually get like very significant speed ups there, but it just needs like some larger changes in the, uh, the wall code. And it's like a significant amount of work on its own. But I think it's, unrealistic to add like to get this committed without those improvements there's also a lot of place that should do better prefetching but uh, there's a talk by thomas Munro earlier in quote unquote today i think that addresses some of that uh, i assume i haven't yet seen the slides or heard, heard his talk because it's not yet hasn't yet happened in my timeline a uh, vacuum is also considerably faster for the first uh, for the heap scan because that uses the prefetching logic and i saw like universal benefits i didn't find a single case where that the first uh, phase is slower there is cases where the second where the index scans are slower because currently the b tree vacuuming code doesn't yet use the, pref uh, the read ahead helper but that's pretty easy to add i just haven't gotten around to it there's also again the problem of like not having yet efficient logic for when to write data back, uh, or not using that logic yet. And uh, the other two cases where very significant benefits are, where I said earlier that those are the biggest problems, uh, I saw big improvements for CheckPointer and BG Writer, and again both for buffered and non-buffered I/O. Uh, but the benefits are bigger with non-buffered I/O just because that allows us to get better better CPU usage by not having to do all those, uh, the overhead of like the copying and the management of the page cache. What's uh, next basically with this prototype? I think to fully be able to evaluate it, we need to use AO in more places. And that's basically just the places that I previously mentioned. Uh, there's the scalability problems that come from just using I one Uring and like having a bunch of other stupid locking that I just haven't addressed yet. And I think then the big issue is to make sure that wall uh, is can use with the current API, with the then current API uh, AAO efficiently, because I think that's such an important part of the product. And I think we can't go forward without having so addressed, uh, figured out how the API for that needs to look like. And then we, I think we should figure out whether it's feasible to use like a process-based fallbacks for platforms where we don't have a native asynchronous IO implementation. And that would be easier if Postgres were threaded, but it's not. So we have to make do with processes. And that adds some complexity, but I think it, it might be doable. And it would be very nice if we wouldn't have to maintain several code paths for using asynchronous IO, non, not using asynchronous IO, because I think the complexity effects of that would be uh, pretty annoying. Yeah, and with that, I am done, and I hope uh, I have not confused you too much. And here's uh, some links to read up uh, on if both if you are confused and not confused, and if there are questions, uh, I hope it will work that I can answer them now. Thanks. And we're back with Q&A with Andres. Take it away, sir. Hello. So the first question I see here um, is from Jeff Davis. And it's asking, can you clarify where the benefits of AIO come from when still doing buffered IO? And uh, like I said, there are several different cases, and uh, depending on which workload you're looking at. One uh, benefit is that you just have fewer system calls, and you can uh, we can combine the different uh, read requests for different pages into one larger read request because we have the necessary data. And that reduce, makes like the file system and the page cache overhead lower because the kernel doesn't have to do the repeated work for each of the different eight kilobyte IELTS. And that can be a significant benefit. There's also operations that when doing with buffered IO are still synchronous, like for example, F-Syncs, and they now can be made asynchronous, which can give you quite substantial benefits for 
stuff like wall or checkpointing and so on. Um, we also like often hit like short term uh, like cases where the uh, operating system basically throttles our uh, writes or whatever, and uh, it, then we the normally buffered and like, kind of asynchronous uh, system calls suddenly get very slow, and we wait, and that those kinds of delays are not there anymore if we uh, use uh, like asynchronous error. The next question is from Fabrizio Mello, and it's about whether the sufficient completion queues can be new bottlenecks. Uh, and yes, they can be, uh, but one has to do a lot of I.O. Uh, the current days, currently some bottlenecks around that, but they're all because we have to acquire locks around them, so they're on the locks, not actually on the uh, I.O. Ring, uh, ring buffers themselves. And the reason we have to take locks is basically because like the follow scripts in the queue entries refer to like local um, per process uh, follow scripts. And so if you didn't take the locks, you would get very confused. Um, there might, there's some ways you can address in different ways, but they can be, but I don't think it will be a big problem. The next question is uh, from Jay Peterson. Uh, what are you expecting to be the kernel baseline since you did the end of this work on buffered IO and in IO Uring? I would hope that it will work with 5.1. I haven't actually tested 5.1 because I think um, it's a bit too early because it's not, not everything is right done the right way so it seems like wasted work to evaluate that it works with 5.1 uh, but it would i would hope that it works with 5.1 because i think uh we're not going to use uh too much of the newer uh, facilities i think there might be some limits uh performance wise uh where like we're not going to be as fast as with later versions of uh, uh later kernel versions but that seems okay and not really our problem mm -hmm. Um, Deep asks, you mentioned that we had a temper, uh, hampered by the one gigabyte file binders. How adversely will such an effect, uh, event effect read ahead? Uh, that really depends on how, uh, what kind of storage you're on. If you're on a very low latency storage device, like for example, a local uh, SSD, then it doesn't hurt you too much. You see a small dip, but if you instead look at like uh, a very fast, but like high latency, block storage device like uh, cloud storage uh, type situation, uh, then you can see that uh, it is a good bit of throughput because it will take quite a while to, for the performance to catch back up. And so like it takes like 100 megabytes and then just tell you like caught up at the previous processing speed. And that gives you like a loss of like uh, 10, 20% of throughput. And depending on whether there's other nodes on top of that sequential scan that are now going to be slower, it can be worse. Um, uh, so if he doesn't ask, do you see wall as a requirement for inclusion? And yes, I think so. Not necessarily because of the way uh, the, the performance improvements, but more because it, I think, might imply design constraints that would be harder to address if we haven't gotten that right. Uh, uh, initially and because then we would have to change more code around it. So I think at the very, very least, you would want to have uh, the wall working well uh, in a separate patch as part of the patch series. And we don't necessarily have to commit that in the first uh, iteration, but I think we have to have know how exactly how, like how it works. And Jeff asks, how did you solve the AO across processes issue? And basically, the reason that it works is that we have the IO rings map, we map them in Postmaster. So every different process has access to the completion ring. And upon completion, so if there, if an IO is blocked, uh, or if a backend is blocked on an I, uh, like a buffer, it's in the buffer there's a notion, like a new reference to which, uh, like one of those PGIO in progress structs uh, is associated with the IO and then you can go like as, look at that um, struct and see which of the rings uh, is being used. And with that, it can then like wait for the events uh, in the ring to have completed and execute the completions associated with that. There are some complexities with having the 
U-rings shared between processes because uh, when you submit right, like events to the submission to you, we have to take a lock while submitting because the file descriptors that are in there are going to refer to the submitting process. And some, so if another process submitted the queue entries, it would, the IO would work, work differently. Uh, there are some ways IO Uring can avoid that, but I'm not sure. Uh, not all that really works at all for our case. And uh, I don't think it'll, the locking around that will be a problem because we just ha can have like mo one IOU ring for each process and just have the completions like basically shared. And, and yeah, so I think that should work out okay. I haven't yet fully done all the validating work. And uh, there's one more question and it is, do you see this uh, expanding to the network layer too? And yes, I, I think so. Um, in particular, just uh, avoiding when we currently read data from the client, uh, when we finish a query, for example, we do we send out the data, then we uh, call like the receive, and then receive will say, "Hey, I'm in non-blocking socket, and there's no data available yet." And then we use ePoll to wait for uh, the network I/O, and if you can combine all of that work into one system call, we actually save a lot of uh, CPU cycles and context switches. And for transaction workloads, that uh, like reduces the overhead quite substantially. I think I've very little done a tiny bit of prototyping to experiment with that, and I got it doesn't, definitely isn't correct. So I didn't, didn't want to include the numbers, uh, but I saw like pretty good speed up for a PG bench uh, type uh, like read only workload. Yeah, and I think that's it with the questions now. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Andres. Goodbye.